One of the few silver linings of the last 12 months was the amount of exciting and rather excellent new cars that have been released. That's what makes the week of Wheels Car of the Year so fantastic. These are the 21 best cars that we've driven in the last 12 months. Our job over the next five days is to find a winner that delivers excellence against the Car of the Year criteria. Our playground is the Anglesey testing facility and the winner is revealed at the end of this video. We have performance cars, perception altering electric cars, luxury sedans and the best family cars and SUVs you can buy. That means we've got a lot to get through. So let's get into the highlights of 2021's best new cars. This year's field of 21 contenders can be split roughly into four groups. First up are family SUVs, which range from the enormous Toyota Land Cruiser 300 series, Hyundai Palisade and Kia Carnival, through to medium-sized SUVs like the Kia Sportage, Hyundai Tucson, Lexus NX and Genesis GV70. Passenger cars also make a strong showing, with the Honda Civic, Volkswagen Golf, Subaru Outback and Skoda Octavia all in contention. While Mercedes has two shots at the trophy in its S-Class flagship and the all-new W206 C-Class. Aussie buyers are quickly embracing EVs and this year we have six fully electric models, including the Mazda MX-30, the BMW iX, Polestar 2 and the South Korean Twins Under the Skin, the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and the Kia EV6. The Porsche Taycan Cross is our sixth EV and it's also one of our final group, which is performance cars. This group is rounded out by the Subaru BRZ and the Hyundai i20N, which both offer driving thrills at an affordable price. So they're our contenders. Let's get on with the testing. Let's start with one of the most interesting new releases in the last 12 months, the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Now at first blush, you might think this looks like a large hatch, but in reality, it's the size of a medium SUV. It's cleverly disguised its size, although it has a three metre wheelbase, which allows for excellent packaging inside. It has a sliding console and an adjustable rear seat. Now space efficiency and packaging are important aspects of Car of the Year, and that's why we start this process with a static walk around. The walk-around process is a chance for judges to award points for interior comfort and quality, value, and also the execution of any in-car technology. Early standouts included the Mazda MX-30 and the Honda Civic. They both did lose marks when it came to value because of their high sticker prices, but the Mazda's quirky, style-driven interior and the Honda's newfound sense of space and clean design did impress the judges. The Hyundai Tucson and Kia Sportage also scored well early, thanks to their brave exterior styling, strong focus on value and useful interior tech, like the eye-catching digital dash in the Sportage's flagship GT line. Exploring interior design is an essential part of Car of the Year testing. So we thought we would showcase that with a particularly notable example from the Car of the Year field, the latest generation Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Now the S-Class is a former winner of Car of the Year in 1999, and over the decades it's been particularly renowned for introducing innovations, whether it's vehicle safety with ABS, anti-lock brakes, or even suspension systems that read the road ahead and adjust accordingly. But here with this latest generation S-Class, the tech is all about the cabin infotainment system. The S-Class is traditionally the technology forefront for Mercedes-Benz. It's a supremely comfortable, luxurious, big limousine, as you'd expect of an S-Class. You get in it and it's like a warm embrace from a loved one kind of thing. It's got these goose down little pillows that you rest your head on. Wall to wall electronics, that interior lighting, you know, the mood lighting is just so cool. You know, like totally unnecessary stuff that you love because it's an S-Class. 
This is a $250,000 car and $300,000 if you include all the options. But the great thing about the S-Class is that a lot of its technology filters down to smaller and more affordable Mercedes models, including this, another new generation Mercedes. It's the new C-Class W206. And some of that tech includes rear wheel steering that helps shorten the wheelbase and tightens the turning circle. And inside, it's another fancy large infotainment screen and very much a baby S-Class experience. With the walkarounds complete and plenty of early points tallied, each contender is then let loose around the proving ground, which gives us a chance to assess their ride and handling, performance and refinement. Our dynamic loop includes a rough ride section, high speed lane change, a dirt exercise and a challenging winding course. And if you're into driving, as of course we hope you are, we've got a couple of high performance cars here too, including this, the Hyundai i20N. It's got a 150 kilowatt turbocharged four cylinder up front, a mechanical LSD, and it's even got a bit of WRC DNA coursing in its veins. And the best bit, it costs just $35,000, which makes this car an absolute performance car bargain. In some ways, the i20N was the most fun of the entire field. In terms of delivering what it says on the box, it's an absolute 10 out of 10. It's got a, a lovely punchy turbo engine. It's just really chuckable. I think every young driver should try a car like this once in their lifetime. So they can really appreciate driving dynamics in a small, hot hatch. If it's speed and agility you're after, it doesn't get much better than this. Porsche's all-electric Taycan. It wasn't here in time for last year's event, but it's made it this year with the new Cross Turismo. It's a jacked up, almost SUV style wagon, but don't think this is an SUV, it's much more capable than that. In fact, this is the fastest, most potent, possibly best handling car we have at this year's Car of the Year. But it's been most impressive through the slalom. Most other cars we've been doing 60 or 80 through the lane change. In the Taycan, you can go through at 100 without even breaking a sweat. <laughs> it feels like you could do 120 through there and it would still be fine. The car's just planted on the road. Massive tyres. I really enjoyed driving it. Felt special sitting inside it. You know, there's so much portionness about the way that it drives. Anyone who fears that uh, the future is electric means we have to take a step back in driver involvement and ability. Don't have to think that at all because this car is super quick. I would take that car home tomorrow, but it's $270,000, so it probably won't be. If the Porsche Taycan is the quickest car in this year's Coddy Field, well, this one, the second generation Subaru BRZ, might just be the most fun. The BRZ has long been one of our favourite performance cars here at Wheels, and it's a previous Car of the Year winner, of course. And for this second generation vehicle, Subaru has really focused on fixing the key criticisms of the original car. So it's still affordable, that's a big thing, around 40 grand for this S model, but they've now fitted a much larger capacity engine, and that has delivered a substantial boost in power and in torque, and it sounds awesome, I reckon. Some of that noise is piped into the cabin and a lot of people probably won't like that, but personally, I think it sounds pretty cool. It's just such a wonderful car to drive. It's absolutely a driver's car. Importantly, it's got some more torque this time, so it, drivability has improved. Truth be told, it feels pretty much exactly the same as the old car, if I'm honest, for its handling. It just now has a little bit more torque, which is what everybody wanted. And the question is, you know, you know could they have just moved this on a little bit more in some other ways. And it just absolutely nails the basics. The seating position is bang on. The steering is really, really good. And because the recipe of an affordable sports car with a manual gearbox and a rear drive chassis, it means that on our dirt section, we don't just test the calibration of the electronics, we can have some fun too. <laughs> Clearly, the dirt course is a huge amount of fun, 
but it also reveals strengths and weaknesses you don't encounter on tarmac. In many ways, it's Australia's version of the infamous moose test. We drive on dirt roads a lot in this country, so it's important to have a well-calibrated electronic safety system that allows a little bit of movement but won't let you spin the car. And that was one of the biggest areas of difference, one of the most variable areas with all the cars was just how the ESC worked. Some cars are very tightly controlled, um, very safety conscious, and other cars sort of step on in progressively from there with allowing a little bit of movement. I think the Mercedes C-Class had the best ESC calibration by a long way. It just kept the car nice and straight, even when you're trying to throw it off a dirt road. The one thing that really overshot my expectations was how the dual engine EVs performed on gravel in a discipline where you really wouldn't expect them to shine, where you'd expect to find chicks in their armour. They were absolutely superb. This is the Polestar 2 and at 65 grand, it's one of the most affordable electric vehicles at this car of the year. Build quality and design ethos are real highlights, but unfortunately, many of the safety features are only offered in pricey options packages. It has that wonderful understated quality about it. It's not got chrome everywhere in the cabin. It doesn't have gaudy badges to say what it is. It's just subtle touches. For a lot of people, that would be a really, really good all round and adequate EV. This is the hotly anticipated Land Cruiser 300 series. We're so excited to have this car here this year because it's been about a billion years since Toyota released the last Land Cruiser. Now we've got some really good on-road cars and in their company, this isn't perhaps the strongest performer. But where this car really excels is away from the asphalt on loose surfaces and horrible knobbly tracks like this. And one of the main reasons for that is because it was extensively developed right here in Australia. Oh, and if you're worried about the V8 not being available anymore, don't worry, because it's replaced by this amazing 227 kilowatt, 700 newton meter V6 turbo diesel. The real highlight for me for the new 300 Land Cruiser is the powertrain. I don't miss the V8 diesel. I've got to say, I think that the twin turbo engine is, is terrific and actually kind of surprisingly refined. There's no you know, loss in performance. It's engaging, it's quick, it even sounds really good. I honestly reckon if you don't have your ears tuned into it, you wouldn't even know that the change has happened. It's so strong, so versatile. You've got a bit of an improvement to fuel economy. I think that was the inevitable thing that has to happen to Land Cruiser, and it is a massive improvement. As part of our testing, we also record each contender's weight, zero to 100 acceleration times, and emergency braking distances to see how they compare against the manufacturer's official claim. We also take a decibel reading at different speeds to assess cabin refinement. We then use these independent numbers to help us set the pecking order. Hit the pause button if you want to digest the full data set, but with three days of testing complete, it was clear that some cars were excelling more than others. There were six models that stood out, and the next stage was to test their metal on our challenging road course. Our test loop for round two is only short, but what it lacks in distance, it more than makes up for with intensity. Made up of an urban and highway section, its true challenge is a fearsome country road element that doesn't just twist and turn, but it features some of the bumpiest and most gnarled tarmac that we've ever encountered. Lining up to tackle the course are our six finalists. Leading the SUV brigade are the BMW iX and Hyundai Palisade, while the Mercedes C-Class and Volkswagen Golf are both upholding the reputation of iconic nameplates. Forging a brave new path for EVs, and also for South Korea, are the Kia EV6 and Hyundai Ioniq 5. But while all of our finalists impressed in round one, the road loop does expose some weaknesses. Here's how they stacked up after another two days of testing and the final votes were cast. 
I think it's one of the coolest electric cars I've ever driven. They've taken the whole opportunity of a electric platform and actually done something with it. The BMW iX really makes a fashion statement. It's big, it's bold. The designers call it monolithic. And in fact, you can see that it looks like it's been carved out of a B slab of granite. Perhaps not quite as quirky as the i3, but very dramatic interior with some wonderful use of materials. As an SUV, ultimately, it's probably uh, more practical. It's definitely spacious, and it was definitely nice to spend time in. That interior has so much wow factor. It feels very, very special, but it also majors on comfort, practicality, and packaging. I really, really like spending time in that cabin broad quilting patterns that go all down the sides of the seats, you know, just the dark silver touches. As a clean sheet styling exercise, it's absolutely amazing. It's got this big open area with no transmission tunnel, this massive screen in the middle and almost like this little, uh, you know, prairie cliff out of the Lion King for the centre console with this crystal selector. It's like BMW rated a Swarovski store because you've got these crystallised elements on the, on the door controls. You've got gem style rotary controller for the infotainment, the transmission lever. Like that's, it strikes such a beautiful line between being overly ostentatious but just about forgivable. I think the novelty might wear off on a lot of those bits and pieces, especially the doors. They've got a little button that you push, then you've got to open the door like that. And I think the first three times, it's fun. I think after 300 times, you might just wish for a little door handle. And especially in the complication of the user interface of the car. It's just, it's nowhere near um, as intuitive. It doesn't have the clarity. Finding like a drive mode selector and changing the regenerative braking, all of those things are, are not intuitive at all. Just the menu, menus and the apps and all that kind of stuff. They say you shouldn't use your phone on the road. Wait till you see the BMW iX's infotainment system. I think I could get used to it, but Cars shouldn't be something you need to get used to, they need to be immediately alluring. But you know, it's got a, a CD rating of 0.25. For a big car like that, that's very impressive. And you can see how they've done it as well, with the flush door handles, the frame, frameless glass. There's no getting away from the fact that it's a heavy electric vehicle, but it is, it is one of the more accomplished electric vehicles that, that I've driven, and it's very fast. It really flaunts its EV funkiness. Our very challenging road loop sort of exposed a few shortcomings that we perhaps didn't notice at the proving ground. The ride became quite stiff and restless. The steering wheel, which I initially loved for its sort of hexagonal design, it felt a bit big in the hands. It lacks a little bit of the um, flexibility and all-round polish that uh, the Koreans do, but man, it's an easy car to like. It's trying to say something different from other SUVs. And yes, it's an electric, and people wanting this type of vehicle, I think they want something special. On paper, it feels like an old recipe just repeated. So it's a big family bus with a lot of seats and a pretty old diesel engine, but it's the way that it has been executed that has really elevated it amongst the pack. It presents itself as quite a, a premium Americanized sort of take on you know, plus size SUVs, and it delivers largely in the experience. The exterior has a certain richness about it for its price point. I love the cut of its jib, I love the packaging. It's not necessarily as fresh or as forward thinking as some of the other competitors, but it does what it claims on the box and then some. It's nearly five metres long, but even in that context, it's relatively space efficient. You get loads of equipment, loads of comfort features. It feels really richly specced out inside. Up front, it's loaded with all the creature comforts you'd expect for the driver and front passenger. Second row, lots of leg room, and even the third row, row with three seats across. The whole family will cruise along very happily in this SUV. The version we had was quite expensive. We're into sort of mid 70s, but I still think that you're getting an awful lot for your money. It sort of turned my opinion a little bit. I would actually go for this top spec GT line version of the Palisade. Even though it is a little bit pricey, it certainly doesn't feel like poor value. Really, there's nothing else in the class that can offer you an eight seat SUV for the same cash. In fact, I can't think of anything. 2.2 litre diesel 
in the Palisades sounds like it would be underbaked, but in the experience, it was quiet, it was refined, offers more than enough shove. It's quite rare to find a diesel that's as polished. It's so comfortable, that diesel torque is lovely, it feels rock solid put together. It's just a really, really, really good thing. It was surprisingly good to drive both cruising and on twisty bits of road. But for me, the standout for that car was its manners on proper Australian roads. You might think a big bus like this, which feels like a van in a lot of ways, might be a little bit scrappy, particularly on the really challenging roads that we threw at it, but it's very composed. Handled the twisties surprisingly well and, and better than some of the other big vehicles that we had here, and that include the BMW iX. It was quiet uh, on the course chip. It was actually really, really silent. Not too much wind noise, despite being like a piano when it comes to aerodynamics. If someone said to me, you've got to choose a car from the whole field and you've got to drive around in it for the next five years and you can't drive anything else, pick one. I would pick the Hyundai Palisade. It's just a really comfortable thing to bomb across challenging Australian conditions for long periods of time. It's just a great companion. It does everything that you ask of it, it does it honestly, it does it to the best of its ability and it does it well. Whenever a new Golf is built, I feel the VW bosses say to the development team, okay, you can change the Golf by this much, but no more. It's just taken each element of what makes the Golf so good on a little bit. I like the confidence VW has in maintaining that tradition. Uh, and when you drive it, you can't really criticize them for evolving those things because the benefit of that is you get a car that is just so complete. No surprises with the Golf's interior the presentation, the quality. It's still one of the benchmarks in the mainstream class. They've taken like an evolutionary approach to like the ergonomics uh, and the car itself. There's some great design touches in there. Yes, you can nitpick in some areas. You know, the plastics on the doors are soft on the front, hard on the rear, so there's some cost cutting there. The one new aspect of the car, which is the user interface, the infotainment system, is just the real main part that lets it down. They've moved so many of the controls, like the air conditioning and stuff, to the centre screen, which can be really annoying and fiddly. It would be nice if there were some physical dials for some controls, particularly climate, where you have to press this climber button. It doesn't illuminate at night, so there's just like this extra one or two steps that just seem unnecessary. It is one of the most beautifully surprising and delightful cars I drove both at the Proving Ground and on the road. And the Golf still feels light and nimble and just manageable. And every time you jump in it, it just feels like putting on an old pair of boots. No, old pair of plimp soles. It's great dynamics that you can have at an affordable price. It just feels so polished. The depth of engineering in that car is so impressive. The Volkswagen also has a, a surprisingly accomplished and fun chassis. There's a bit of a warm hatch element to the way that it handles. Everything, the engine, the chassis, the ride and handling balance is expertly judged. I think the eight-speed automatic brings a much improved powertrain experience than the old dual clutch. For the days you're just commuting, it's efficient, it's quiet, easy to drive. And then if you haven't hit the back roads, it just offers all of that dynamism with a little bit of sort of hint of GTI in it. Just wondering, we're now into the eighth generation Golf, it would be nice to see some more contemporary technology, even if it was a mild hybrid system. I still think people look at that car and understand why a small hatchback is so good for so many people. It's such a little sweetheart of a thing, and compared to like all the EVs here, it feels so light and agile, and it's just a joy to drive. Forget about comparing this with Focuses, Corollas, i30s. This is a car worthy of comparison with A-classes and 1 Series, and I'd go as far to say that this car is better. The Mercedes C-Class is a very popular car in Australia, and I can see why. It's pretty much the highest tech, latest model that Mercedes makes, and it's a C-Class, like it's a huge deal. I really like the exterior design of the C-Class. I like the swoopy form, I like the detailing around the lamps and the grill. I think the baby S-Class tag has become a bit of a cliche, but you step into the cabin from the S-Class, which is in our field, you kind of, it, it's like a facsimile of the limo's cabin. 
Obviously, you're not going to expect to get the quality and the value that you will for a very expensive S-Class, but there is a little bit of that hint. It just suggests you're getting into the territory of an S-Class. The timber, the leather, the stitching, the bit of aluminium details around the edges, uh, the effort they put into the air vents, the illumination around them, these are the things that make you feel special. I'm not sure a base C200 has ever felt as luxurious as the new generation C-Class. It's so nice inside and it's incredibly high tech, obviously. It's got that beautiful waterfall cascading infotainment screen. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are huge on that big screen. The other thing that really impressed me was how the C200 drives. The C200 did not feel like an entry-level car. It kind of felt a little bit more puristic. It had more of a rear drive, kind of sports sedan character up the twisty road. The transmission keeps the engine in a sweet spot. It's got a nice roar to it. I wouldn't be deterred from the 1.5 uh, when you look at it on capacity. You do get some extra features on the C300, but most of those are kind of sort of active driver aid technologies. For me, the C200, I don't think you really notice any difference. For the first time, we could say the C200, the entry-level C-Class, is the one probably to go for for a lot of people. The C-Class handles like a, a true luxury sedan. There's multiple settings for, for comfort or sport to suit your individual taste. And the suspension setup, even on passive dampers, is nicely judged. It's not too firm, not too fidgety, and it also handled our pretty challenging road loop very well. The C200 was just such a sweet car on its passive damper setup. It's got a really great match of spring rate to damper rate. It feels more natural, and even on Australian roads, it wasn't bullied and punished around, it actually drove just beautifully. The rear wheel steering in the car is incredible. I love rear wheel steering. It just changes everything about it. Its nature is more stable at high speed. The turning circle is microscopic and dynamically up a twisty road has that effect of, you know, improving the stability and giving you that low speed agility. Thumbs up for the all-wheel steering. They've definitely lifted their game with the C-Class, but they've also raised the price accordingly to match. It's now an almost $80,000 car before on roads. Considerably more expensive than its rivals. There is a lot of spec, a lot of equipment that now comes as standard. It does feel 80 grand, but there's no escaping that it is an expensive car. That means the final two spots on the podium come down to a pair of electric cars from Korea. The Hyundai Ioniq 5 and the Kia EV6 are twins under the skin. They share a platform and were jointly developed. So splitting them apart to award a winner wasn't easy. I was worried it was going to be really difficult to pull those two cars apart. But as we drove them more, uh, particularly when we took them out into the real world and put them on proper Aussie roads, they revealed their true personalities. It's like different flavours. It's like different toppings on a pizza, you know? Some days you feel like the Hawaiian and other days you're not a weirdo and you want to go for the margarita. Both do the job. Um, it's just a case by case. Both Koreans, Kia and Hyundai, they've come on in leaps and bounds, and I think they are now the companies to watch to challenge companies like Tesla and Toyota. Hyundai Ioniq 5, wow. Kudos to Hyundai for being so brave with its first dedicated electric car. It looks like a concept car that ran away from the motor show stand. It makes such a visual impact. The owner of this sort of car is sending a message to the world that I'm ready for the future, and I want it now. It looks a lot bigger in the flesh than it does in photos. Photo kind of looks like a, like a mid-sized hatch, but in reality, it's more like a, a mid-sized SUV. It also majors on wow factor, it makes a huge statement as soon as you get in the car, but it's full of cutting edge technology. The infotainment system is very, very good, very intuitive. There's a really lovely airy feel to the cabin, very roomy, tons of leg room, lots of headroom, and the back seat bench is really comfortable. And you sit in the rear seat and look up into the panoramic sunroof, uh, you, you think you're in some sort of spaceship. It's a world of light and the seats are sitting high and the moonroof is massive and the, the vision is incredible. I will say some of the material quality does get worse the further back you get in the car. So it feels very richly specced up front, but in the boot, some of the plastics do feel a little bit cheap. 
a little bit stingy, so it kind of feels like they may have run out of money there, or they've just put most of the development budget into the front where people are going to sit. It was quite interesting in sitting in both cars that they felt very different. The driving position, a bit more sit on, a bit more elevated in the Ionic 5, whereas in the EV6, a bit of a sportier, lower slung position. The Kia is much swoopier, much sportier in its intent. You notice that on the outside, but also when you hop inside the cabin, you feel like you're looking through a gun slit where in the Hyundai it's much airier and there's a greater sense of space, but in the Kia it feels sportier as soon as you slip inside the driver's seat. Uh, you immediately feel comfortable, you're immersed in the car, it's very contemporary in its execution, large screen, beautiful detailing. It, it's quite, a, quite a, a nice place to drive. Felt quite a bit darker in there, you know, it's like someone's turned out the lights when you, if you step in that from the Ionic 5 because, yeah, you've got like a sloping roof line. It's a black interior. You do sit lower in the EV6. It is a lower, slightly lower car than the, than the Ionic, even though they're both these big, tall, heavy SUV kind of things. I do prefer the EV6. Both cars come with vehicle to load capability on the exterior where you can plug things like, you know, toaster, laptop, camping equipment or whatever, so really clever. But the Kia adds something extra and that's a power source, three pin plug under the rear seat. So that actually means whereas in the Hyundai, yes, you can plug in your laptop, the car has to be stationary. You can have someone in the back seat with their laptop charging up while they're doing their work in the back while someone else is driving. I think that's pretty clever. The EV6 will appeal to a lot of people. It's a great size. It really is like a medium SUV. It's got style, it's got practicality, it's, and it's got performance. There's a sportier setup for the EV6 compared with the Ionic 5. So that brought a little bit of a surprise in that, yes, there might have been a, some extra firmness to the low speed ride, but then when you went out into the country road, the EV6 was just more controlled. It was more sophisticated in the way that it dealt with the challenges of country road bumps. It's more firmly sprung and the damping in the car feels a lot more sophisticated. So when you hit a bump, it doesn't sort of have that secondary movement like you get in the Hyundai. Instead, you sort of just, the car recovers really quickly and really well, which gives you the confidence to perhaps push that car more quickly and extract more driver involvement and fun than you get in the Hyundai. You put your foot down and it just kind of goes woof, woof. And it's got the fake engine noise coming in through the speakers and stuff like that, but it's cool, you know, it, it sounds interesting. If you had to pick a sort of performance focused car, it would definitely be the Kia. But if you're after one which was just softer and a little bit more relaxing, I would say probably the Ionic. I love the delivery of the power and torque. It's quiet, it's serene. It would be a great car to run around in the city at night time with friends, which is where in my mind, that car's uh, more at home than building along a lumpy country road. The Ionic is kind of the, the sort of the blonde surfer. It's the one that is far more carefree. It just sort of floats along. It has, you know, no sort of troubles. The way that it handles corners, it's very flat. There's loads of grip. A really beautiful electric drivetrain, and particularly in the all-wheel drive, you know, brings surprising traction on dirt, for example, very seamless transition between the axles. What I will say is when you start to lean on the chassis, it did expose some shortcomings in the Ionic 5's dynamic repertoire. We had quite a lot of bump steer. There was quite a lot of vertical and lateral movement on really big bumps and, and challenging roads carrying high speed. And we certainly didn't get that kind of movement and scrappiness in the other Korean EV we have here, the Kia EV6. If you are recommending one car, that comes down to the user. You couldn't just say generally as a, a rule, I'd go the EV6 over the Ionic, because what they do is so specifically different, you'd have to do it on a case by case. But in this case, Wheels Car of the Year only awards one winner. There was a brief moment where we considered a joint award, but when it came time for the judges to crunch their scores, one of the two EVs did edge its nose unanimously ahead. And that car was the Kia EV6.
So why did the Kia EV6 win? Well, in all of our objective tests, it was fractionally superior to the Hyundai. It's a smidge quicker, a touch quieter, and its Aussie tuned suspension offers greater composure. It really is a landmark car for Kia. It's striking to look at, special to sit in, and against the car of the year criteria, it scored the most points. This is the first time Kia has won our award and it's recognition of just how far the brand has come. The EV6 isn't only poles apart from those early models for dynamics and quality, it's desirable, it's seductive, and it's brilliantly engineered. Kia is putting the motoring world on notice.